Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Yield Pyramid. Today we're going to be talking about nitrogen. While giving our Yield Pyramid course in person to audiences, I often get asked the question, Troy, don't you think that nitrogen should be one of our foundation blocks in our Yield Pyramid? And it may feel like it should be because we talk about nitrogen so frequently because it's a very mobile nutrient and it's a very dynamic part of our nutrient management system. But what we've learned over the years is if we have our foundation blocks taken care of in our yield pyramid, our nitrogen use efficiency can improve drastically. And what I mean by nitrogen use efficiency is the amount of nitrogen it takes to grow a bushel of corn. Now, we have some growers who have nitrogen use efficiencies as low as 0.6 to 0.8 units of nitrogen per bushel of corn in a 250 plus bushel yield environment. Others might be using 1 to 1.2 units of nitrogen per bushel of corn, depending on how well they have their foundation of their pyramid taken care of. Also, the other things that affect that could be the source of nitrogen that they're using and the timing and incorporation or not incorporating that nitrogen. So let's go ahead and let's talk about different forms of nitrogen and also let's go ahead and take a look first at a chart showing the uptake of nitrogen throughout the corn growing season. As you can see we use very little nitrogen through V6 and almost V8. Uh, very little nitrogen is required by the corn plant. After that, once we hit that growth spurt in corn through pollination, we have a very rapid uptake and large needs for nitrogen. Now, one of the things that's changed over the years is modern hybrids are still using approximately a third of their nitrogen from pollination through the end of grain fill. So we need to ensure that we have adequate nitrogen supply toward the end of the growing season. And many people ask, well, how do we do that? And the answer is simply not just go ahead and apply more nitrogen. It comes down to the timing and the forms that we're using as well as the use of stabilizers to help ensure us we have adequate late season nitrogen availability. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the commonly used nitrogen sources and their advantages and disadvantages. We're going to start off with anhydrous. And I am a big fan of using anhydrous as say 75% of your total nitrogen program. And there's really three reasons for that. One is that we can very accurately apply anhydrous, which is always a good thing. The second is that we are placing anhydrous deeper in the soil profile than we are any other nitrogen source. And you might ask, well, why is that important, Troy? And I guess I go back to the example of the fence post. For those of you that used to fix fence years ago, or maybe still do, where does that fence post rot off at? it rots off right there at the soil surface. And the reason for that is that's because where the soil warms up more quickly in the spring, and it's also where the highest oxygen levels are in our soil profile. Therefore, those two things really drive microbial activity. Now, it's the same microbial activity that rots off that fence post that also converts our commercial fertilizer that we apply to nitrate. And once it's in a nitrate form is when we can lose it. So, Again, placing anhydrous deep into the soil profile just automatically slows down that conversion process. Now, the third thing that helps nitro or anhydrous be such a stable nitrogen form is the fact that it actually has its own, if you will, built-in stabilizer. When the anhydrous is applied to the soil, there's a very violent chemical reaction that occurs as the gas converts over to ammonium and it's this violent reaction that actually kills most of the microbes in that expansion zone. So it actually takes four to six weeks for those microbes to enter back into our zone of application where we put our anhydrous, therefore actually acting a little bit like a stabilizer in itself. And we'll talk more about stabilizers as we move through today's episode. Now, a couple disadvantages to anhydrous, we all know that we have the plant back restrictions. We need to wait that seven to 10 days, preferably after application. And that time frame can vary based on how well things are sealing, as well as the rate and the depth that you're applying that anhydrous at. And then obviously the last, um, the last drawback is that being we are placing the nitrogen deep into the soil profile, our early corn development, maybe up through that V6, V8 
knee-high stage is not able to tap into that nitrogen real well. We've probably all seen some years where you can see those anhydrous streaks where some of the roots are hitting it and some are not. So we can overcome that with, by supplementing some other nitrogen sources that we'll talk about here. Okay, let's move on to our liquid 28s and our 32s, our UAN solutions. Very versatile type of nitrogen that can be applied just about at any time. The one thing that we have seen here in Northeast Iowa is if you are using a liquid program and you're putting on all your nitrogen up front as a liquid, we really encourage you to, for two things. One is to stabilize that nitrogen, use a stabilizer, and then the other thing is try to avoid putting it on as a weed and feed. If we can incorporate that UAN into the soil profile, we will ensure ourselves that we don't have volatilization losses. And the one thing to keep in mind when you're working with 28 or 32 in those liquid solutions is that 50% of the nitrogen that's in our liquid solutions is actually in the urea form. So again, laying large amounts of it on top and waiting for a rain to incorporate it increases risk and oftentimes we see that. Now, the one thing that I really encourage people to do is think about trying to move some of that nitrogen application that you're using with a UAN to as late as possible. Obviously, corn height is gonna limit on how late we can come through with a toolbar, but new tools such as the Y drops are allowing us to put on that last shot of nitrogen right before tassel. And I think that's a great opportunity to try to improve our nitrogen use efficiency. The other nice thing with UAN is that we can add other, nit other nutrient sources to the mix. Things like ammonium thiosulfate to get sulfur on as well as adding boron are two products to add to your UAN solutions that will help improve your overall crop productivity. Now, lastly, on the commercial side, we have urea. And I'll be flat out honest with you, I'm not a big fan of urea. While it can be an excellent source of nitrogen early on, you know, to get that corn plant kicked off and going, we just don't see all urea programs typically yielding that well year in and year out. And one of the main reasons for that is it's difficult to get a very accurate spread with urea. Oftentimes, we can see those streaks in the fields where guys use mostly are all urea. And basically what's happening is right behind the spinner spreader, we're getting larger amounts of nitrogen and at the end of the spread pattern, we're not getting the full rate of nitrogen. And that's probably one of the largest drawbacks when it comes to using dry urea as a large component of your nitrogen program. However, again, like I said, if you're using it for that 10 to 25% of that nice early kick, it can be used quite well. Okay, now we'll talk about a non-commercial source, and that's manure. And manure can be an excellent source of nitrogen as well as all of our other nutrients required for crop production. The two things that you need to do when using manure, if you wanna get the full value of that manure, the first thing is we need to test the manure and send analysis to the lab so that way we know what our nutrient content of that manure is. And I encourage people to always take at least three samples out of any source that they're applying manure to so we can average those out and get a good feel for what our actual nutrient levels are. And then obviously the next important thing is to be as accurate as possible when it comes to, to spreading that manure. And while that can be difficult, especially when you're hauling out dry manure or bedding pack, um, taking the time to maybe weigh a couple loads of manure, see how much you're actually putting on, how, big, how large of an area you, you're covering with that to get a good application rate estimation. And then we can go back and back calculate from our lab analysis how much manure we're actually, or how much nutrients we're actually applying through that manure. With liquid manure, we're fortunate now with technology that there's flow meters that can be installed and these can allow us to apply our gallons per acre very accurately. Now the one thing that I will say with liquid manure, and it can be applied back to dry manure as well, is that getting it incorporated completely at the time of application or shortly after is incredibly important. 
leaving even just a little bit on top, we can have large ammonia losses, which is what most of our nitrogen is in the form of. So again, for those of you guys putting on liquid manure, uh, get all the manure in the slot, and then if possible, use some of those covering discs to then cover the slot, even with just a little bit of residue or soil. It'll make a huge difference in how much nitrogen you'll have available from that manure to your crop. Now, throughout the conversation, I've mentioned many times about stabilizers. And whether you're working with manure or commercial fertilizer, there are stabilizers out there that can help us ensure that we do have nitrogen available late in the growing season to finish out grain fill. Now, there's two different types of stabilizers. One is called nitrification inhibitors and they basically slow the conversion of ammonium to nitrate. And this is uh, very important to keep our nitrogen in place. So ammonium will stay attached to our soil particles and you can have flooded conditions and as long as your nitrogen is in the ammonium form, you're not going to lose any of it. So some products like Enserve and Instinct, which have the active ingredient called nitropyrin, are very effective nitrification inhibitors. And also there's products out there that contain DCD, and those work very well also. Now the other type of stabilizer that's out there is called ure urease inhibitors. And they slow the volatilization of surface applied urea and liquid nitrogen solutions and prevent the volatilization or the gassing off. And a common, the common active ingredient is N, NBPT, mostly used as agrotain out in the countryside. Now, if you are using urea or your liquid solutions and you're incorporating them almost immediately, there really is no need to spend additional dollars on a urease inhibitor. Whereas almost all nitrogen applications could possibly benefit from a nitrification inhibitor. And we go back to the manure uh, examples. We used to, we use in anhydrous applications all the time, don't apply before 50 degrees soil temperatures or below. And so the same in theory goes with manure applications. Um, but obviously when your pit's full and you might need to go out and haul as soon as some crop is off of the field, really think about using like an instinct type product to help stabilize that manure and ensure it's there for you for the next crop season. So a few factors that we found through some local research here in Northeast Iowa that I thought I would just share with you quickly. One of them is the impact of slope on nitrogen use efficiency. And what we have found over the years is in wet growing seasons, the more slope that you have on the field, the more surface runoff you get and therefore the less water that percolates down through your soil profile and the less ponding that you have. And this has shown in our research to have a significant impact on your nitrogen use efficiency. So when you're planning out your nitrogen program or maybe you've had a wet growing season and you're thinking about maybe adding supplemental nitrogen, keep slope uh, into your equation when you're thinking about putting on additional units of nitrogen. Another factor that we have found here in Northeast Iowa that has a great influence on nitrogen application and nitrogen use efficiency is soil organic matter. And your soil organic matter, for every 1% that you have on your soil test, you can count on about 10 to 15 units of nitrogen being released per percent organic matter throughout the growing season. So if you have a soil with 5% organic matter, you will get around five to 75 pounds of nitrogen released every year into your crop production system. So be sure to make those adjustments when you are looking at determining what rate to use in a, in a particular field. So when we think about nitrogen programs overall, one of our goals here in Northeast Iowa is to have around 50 to maybe 75 units of nitrogen, what we call highly available early on. And this will get us up through that V6 to V8 time frame that we had shared on that chart earlier. And then after that, we can use, we can count on like our stable form of anhydrous to carry us through the rest of the year or putting on the rest of our nitrogen through side dress or Y dropping. So we found though that it is critical to have at least 50 units of highly available nitrogen early on to maybe help 
pay, take care of what they call that carbon penalty and just make sure that we have available nitrogen there for the corn plant early while it's maybe waiting to try to get root systems down to that anhydrous or to ensure that we can get our citrus applications on timely. The other thing is we have found is heavy front end loading of nitrogen can um, actually cause our corn plants to become lazy. So this can be an issue when people are using large amounts of manure or when we are going with those all liquid or all urea upfront programs. The corn might look great, dark green, but it actually can cause plants to grow excessively tall um, and predispose them to a lodging. And then also it just seems like those programs don't have the long-term staying power. I wanna to touch briefly on nitrogen management with cover crops. Nitrogen management changes with cover crops because the reason for us starting to use them years ago was to help take up that leftover nitrate that was left in our soil from the previous crop. Well, if it's tied up into our cover crop, that means it's not available for that young corn plant. So what we have found is instead of having that 50 units of nitrogen available early, we should probably be closer to 100 units. Again, because the cover crop is taking up that free nitrate, as well as when we terminate that cover crop and the root system starts to be broken down by the microbes, the microbes tie up even more nitrogen as they're starting to cycle that biomass through. So if we shift a little bit more of our nitrogen program up front, that'll help feed the microbes and still give us some availability to our early growing corn as that cover crop breaks down throughout the growing season, it will release nitrogen later on into the growing season. So we'll, while we found we don't have to apply any more nitrogen, we have to switch our timing. And one of the great places to do that is if you do have nitrogen with your planter. And say like in a two by two or even dribbled behind uh, the closing wheels, we can be very efficient because of the banding effect. And when we start talking about banding nutrients, whether it's nitrogen or potassium or whatnot, we can almost get a two for one return. So banding, say 30 units of nitrogen in a two by two would be the equivalent of broadcasting almost 60 units of nitrogen. So we can get a really good kick. So just be sure that if you are trying some cover crops, ensure that you have enough nitrogen early on for that corn plant and again, UAN or urea are excellent forms of nitrogen to use early on to help provide you that. One other tidbit quick with cover crops is we're finding now planting green is actually one of the better ways to go rather than terminating two weeks prior. And I'll end with this, is with today's technology, we have the ability to do on-farm trials very easily. We can change the rates of our application of nitrogen or whatever nutrient that we're applying, track it very easily through our GPS equipment, and then come back with the scale and the yield monitor and check to see how our results turned out. So I really encourage every one of you to go ahead and do a plus and minus 30 trial on your farm. Take your normal rate, maybe make one or two rounds at an additional 30 units of nitrogen and one or two rounds at 30 less units of nitrogen than what you normally use. And let's go ahead and track that through the growing season and take it to yield. And it would probably best to do that in multiple fields so that way you have some replications. Encourage you to go ahead and take some fall stock nitrate test. They give you a great report card on how you did on total nitrogen throughout the growing season. And do that for a couple years and see where you fall out and many times growers have found that they can tweak their nitrogen program either through stabilizers or through different forms or different timings and greatly improve their nitrogen use efficiency. So go ahead, do those on-farm trials, and that way you can ensure that you're getting the biggest return on investment from your nitrogen. If you have any questions on what we covered in today's episode, be sure to contact your local Pioneer sales representative. From all of us at Pioneer, thank you for your business. Be safe and we'll see you in the fields. That concludes this Pioneer Agronomy video podcast. Visit our page on pioneer.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more agronomy insights.